Okay, so um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who has joined us from different locations. Welcome to the Kony V8 SP3 webinar. My name is Tanmay and I am the community manager at Kony. Um, as you see that we have mentioned everywhere that this is the most important webinar of the year. And why we say that? We say that because this release brings together 50 plus new features to accelerate web development with modern web capabilities, simplify developer experiences, and much more. To cover all of this, we have today with us Senior Director Faizan Khalidi and Suhas Bhatt from Kony. They're going to cover a lot of uh, these features and uh, we'll take the session from there. Um, important info for you guys. Now, after the webinar, we'll be announcing the V8 SP3 Feedback Wave 1. A very important note, uh, all the attendees will receive exclusive access to the private group that we have created on Basecamp, where you will have steps to follow. And there is a complete scenario that you need to follow, followed by the survey. So you need, so all attendees after the session, after today's webinar, you will receive a link, you will join the group, and then after you join the group, you will see a scenario, you have to follow that scenario and complete a survey. The first 25 base camp members, the first 25 attendees who will complete this survey will be awarded $25 Amazon gift card. And there will be one of you who will receive $100 Amazon gift card as a raffle winner. So make sure that you follow all the steps that we tell you after the webinar, after the event is over. And you must attend this webinar. It is very important to you know um, listen to the entire webinar today. So make sure that you uh, listen to the entire webinar and then follow the survey. Uh, to be uh, to become eligible for the feedback wave one. Now, uh, before we start the session, make sure that you post all your questions in the Q&A panel. Do not post your questions in the chat window. We have pool of moderators from Kony watching the Q&A panel. So as in when you post questions, you will quickly get answers to all your questions. Also, we are recording the webinar and we will be posting uh, um, under events. So you can go to uh, basecamp.com slash events and uh, there you will see the recording. Now let's start the presentation. Over to you, Fezan. Thanks, Tanmay. Let me go ahead and share my screen. I hope everyone is able to see this. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the attendees joining us today. Over the next hour, we have a packed agenda, and I'll start with the Kony App Platform Overview, followed by a quick recap of our last few releases before moving to the highlights of the V8 Service Pack 3 release and a summary of the features. Some of us here today may be new to the Kony App Platform or may not be aware of some of the Kony App Platform capabilities, so let me start with a quick overview of the App Platform. The Kony App Platform consists of the Kony Visualizer, which is our front-end visual app design and development platform. The Kony Visualizer uh, provides a low-code visual design canvas. It provides uh, APIs and uh, widgets which help developers to design and develop advanced front-end applications. These applications uh, can be designed and developed for omni-channel such as phones, tablets, desktops, wearable devices, kiosks, and chatbots. The Kony Visualizer provides you capabilities to develop native applications, uh, web applications, as well as hybrid applications. It provides access to all the native functionalities for the underlying native operating systems, and it also provides several advanced web capabilities. Apart from the Kony Visualizer, the Kony App Platform also includes the Kony Fabric. Uh, Kony Fabric Kony Fabric exposes a lot of integration services like uh, uh, access to a lot of data connectors and technology adapters. All of these are abstracted by object services which provide an object-based uh, data model that can be invoked through the, the front end and through several client-side SDKs uh, which provide access to all the back-end services through Fabric. Kony Fabric also provides several API management capabilities as well as uh, other capabilities like orchestration services, node services, and things like that. All of this is, uh, is stacked on top of the analytics that are part of the Kony Fabric, uh, Fabric as well. Now, 
from the Coney App Platform, uh, what you would do is basically you have access to all your enterprise systems and backend. So the Coney Fabric sits on top of that. It provides access to all your uh, enterprise systems and services like uh, a retail system, a campaign management system, or a database, a content management system, or or plain web services, or as well as you know uh, things like you know, personalization services and big data. We also have the Coney Marketplace, uh, which provides you several options of reusability across the entire stack. You can uh, have reusability across applications, across collections within your application, across the components that builds your that are building blocks to your applications, or just simple code modules or backend services, as well as data adapters and API data models. So this kind of summarizes how the Coney App Platform works. Now let's go ahead and go to the re re recap of the last few releases. Here is a recap of the last three releases of the Coney App Platform. V8 was our major release, and since then we have evolved to the Service Pack model and have released two Service Packs, namely Service Pack 1 and Service Pack 2, apart from the latest release. As you may notice, each one of these releases was packed with many new features that simplify and speed up your app development experiences. The V8 release introduced the concept of components to amplify the modularity of the apps and promote reuse. It also introduced the Kony Marketplace, which now has more than 200 components which can be reused across your applications. The V8 release was followed by the SP1 release, which is the Service Pack 1, which was a minor release and it was primarily focused on adding more productivity to the app platform. And finally, the Service Pack 2 release was again a feature pack release with a major focus on web enhancements as well as support for sketch design import and Android, uh, uh, Android Wear. Service Pack 2 was also the release where offline objects became the de facto standard for offline sync for all new projects. In case you want to learn more about the features from any of these earlier releases, you can log into the base camp where you will find documentation, tutorial videos, and our previous webinars covering some of these releases. With that, let us move uh, to the latest release, and I'm excited to present the V8 Service Pack 3. We, with every release, we work with the team, and these are the teams we had for SP3. Each of these teams provided a dedicated amount of focus in certain areas. Like in this particular case, we have modern web design and dev deployment, rich digital experiences, accelerated developer productivity, and Kony Cloud enhancements. To understand how these teams map to the SP3 features, let's move ahead and discuss some of the major features added as part of the front end development. Today, we are going to mainly focus on some of these features, uh, and they are simplified data integration, uh, guided tools, and progressive web application support. The simplified data integration, uh, as part of the simplified data, data integration, you may know that almost every application is connected to some sort of data today. This could be a simple database, a REST service, or some enterprise data providers like Salesforce or SAP. Users may need their applications to connect to data to incorpor incorporate either user authentication, fetch, display, and manage data, or do all, this, all of this within their apps. Data integration is usually the job of an advanced developer or full-stack developer with deep knowledge of the data integration principles. The SP3 release of the Kony app platform makes the data integration for apps simple by providing faster integration with data, unified view of data and presentation layer, ability to drag and drop data elements and auto generation of mapping. Let us now look at these new features in Visualizer. So here is, here is a video that kind of showcases the features that are in Visualizer. The first thing you will notice is a data panel on the top right section of your project. The data panel consists of sample services as well as project services. A couple of examples of software uh, sample services are Microsoft Active Directory, location data, countries data. A sample service is basically a pre-configured set of services that are provided along with every project. These, uh, so that you do not have to, uh, even if you do not have existing services available, you can you go ahead and use these sample services. Here is an example of this uh, of a sample product object. Now this product object has a, a, a get operation and has several fields within it. 
So project services are the services that are part of your project. You can configure new services as part of your project services. The project services here, if you, if you look at the list over here, you have services which, uh, which you can use to authenticate your data, or you, there, are, there are services that provide connectors to you know, get to fetch your data and you know to to manipulate or uh, you know configure uh, your data with several different backends. In this particular example over here, uh, I have an identity service as part of my project, uh, which is the Microsoft Active Directory, and I also have uh, object service, which is the product list. This particular service has a uh, has an items service, which has several different operations associated within that service. They get, create, update, and delete. Each of these operations has a request and response, and the request and response have their fields in turn. <clears throat> now that we have seen how these features have been added into the app platform, let us now look at a few use, use cases where they can be used. We'll first look at how I can create a simple login screen integrated with an authentication provider using these features. This could be connected to an authentication provider like Microsoft Active Directory or use an OAuth provider like Google, LinkedIn, or Box. In this example, we will use one of the sample Microsoft AD services we have within our sample services. So, uh, I, so what I'm going to start with is I'll go through the traditional way of de designing and developing a login screen, right? So the, in the traditional approach, you, what you would basically do is you would design your screen uh, with each of the design elements added to the screen. In this particular case, I'm adding the branding at the top, and then I create a box for uh, my uh, username and my text box fields. And then after I have the two text boxes for the username and the, and the password, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a button uh, that allows me to, to create an action that allows me to log in, right? So that's how you would traditionally, uh, you know, design your screen for, uh, for a login, right? So this is, th this is how you would do it. But this is not what we are going to use today. So I'll go ahead and delete this. And I, I'll show a couple of ways that you can simplify this with the Service Pack 3 release. We have a set of uh, libraries, a set of components which are present within Visualizer. So I've gone ahead and picked up the login, uh, a login collection, and I'm going uh, and dragged it on the screen. I can edit this collection as I want. And once I edit this connection, I'll go to the sample service. I go to the login uh, service in particular, drag and drop it on the button on my screen, and it presents me all the actions that I can associate this with. I go ahead, select the on-click action, and I have the mapping editor uh, open in front of me with the service already invoked. I can go in here and simply go ahead and uh, map the elements that I want to pass to the request of this particular uh, service. So this provides a simplified view of how you can use any existing forms that you have, any existing forms that you have designed, and you know map a service directly onto it. Uh, let's try another uh, aspect of it, and let's simplify this a little bit more. So what I'll do is, and this is, this is what we'll use today, I'll just create a new form and drag and drop the service directly on this. What you see is it, auto it automatically generates the UI for you based on the parameters within the service. It generated the user ID and password and the login button. And the only thing I'm adding here is the branding on top to, to complete my, uh, my design. I can go ahead, edit whatever I want. And then if I go into the service in my project services, I see that the mapping already exists. The service call is already there. The mapping exists. And everything is set for me. Then now what I can do is I can go into the success and the failure callbacks over here. And based uh, at, at this point, what I'm going to do is just create an alert that says, okay, my, uh, my service call has been a success. I'll, and I'll create a similar alert for the failure. Uh, that's it. I can go ahead, run this application, and I'll view it on my app viewer now. One thing you may notice is I, have not, I did not have to publish my application anymore because it automatically, uh, the Visualizer now automatically takes care of publishing your fabric services. You may have already also noticed the QR code on the screen. This is also a new feature that is available in Service Pack 3 with our App Viewer upgrades. So uh, you see that my screen has launched on the App Viewer on the right. I go ahead, fill in my details, 
and log in with my credentials and it's still success. So here, this was a quick example of how you can simplify development using the new drag and drop capabilities uh, within the visualizer. These capabilities are available not only for identity services, but, but all other types of services as well. And that's what we will see uh, going ahead. Now, the next example that we are going to see uh, after the login service, now that our login service is ready, is how we can fetch some data and add it to the application. In this example, I'll connect to a database and fetch and display data on a screen. So uh, now that our login is uh, already uh, done, the login screen is ready, I'll go ahead and add a new form. I'll go to configure new services and I'll select the relational database service from here. After I select the relational database endpoint, I go ahead, add the name of the particular object service, I, and go ahead and add all the configurations that are required for the database. Once I add the configuration, I can test my connection to the database, and when, as soon as I do that, I can go ahead, and it, it goes ahead and you know, generates all the different uh, tables I have and shows me the tables that I have available within my database. I select the specific table, add it to my service, and it shows me all the fields that are available and all the methods that are available for this particular uh, for this particular table. I can go ahead see the response mapping, which is already generated here in this particular. Uh, since we uh, since we generated uh, this from an existing table, the response mapping is available. I can go ahead and add some of the OData query options. In this particular case, I'm filtering it by the top 10 records, and I can just change, uh, I can select my environment and test this out within Visualizer itself. So if you see here, you see the response that is coming up from, you know, from this particular database, and I have all my data available, I have all my fields available in this uh, for the service. I come back to Visualizer, right, and if you see on the right, I see the product list which I just configured. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the, I'm going to just design a simple, you know, title at the top and then drag and drop a, a segment widget. Once I drag and drop a segment widget, I go to the templates and I have I already have a pre, uh, a, a couple of uh, preloaded segments available within, uh, preloaded templates available within the segment. Now, the next thing that I did is I dragged and dropped the data directly on the segment and what it does is it directly maps the top three, uh, the top fields within my service response to the fields that are available within my widgets. I can go ahead, I, I can remap these fields as, uh, as, as needed. So in this particular case, I have, uh, let me go back a bit. So in this particular case, I'm rebinding some of the fields. So if I want to change the field that I'm binding to, I can do that. And then, uh, you know, uh, once, once I've done my mapping, I can, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to add navigation from my earlier login screen to this list form, right? So that's what I'm doing now. I'm going and removing the alert over here. And once I remove the alert, I navigate to the list form. Let's run this on the app viewer now. So I run this on the app viewer, the QR code comes up and the application launches on, since I'm connected to the USB, the application launches, I hit the, I add the credentials and I get the list of all the uh, all the products uh, from the product database directly on the service. So once you drag and drop the data, there are several things that are happening here, right? So once you drag and dra drag and drop the data on your segment, it automatically maps the the fields from your uh, your service uh, re response onto the the widgets that are available within your segment template. What it also does is it creates an action as part of the form load, and there is a new uh, a, a new action that's available, which is called the on mapping event, right? So this on mapping event that's available for the form automatically gets assigned uh, to, uh, to 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 this particular service and invokes the service, and that's where it gets the data from, and then it loads it on on the specific form. Uh, you have seen several different features with, uh, over here within, uh, within this video, the things like floating action editor, which is again a, a, part of, a, a part and new feature of SP3. 
Now, having done that, now that we have added the features to simplify the application integration, we would also want our first-time users of the app platform and the first-time users of these features to easily learn to use these features within Visualizer. To that effect, we have introduced a new concept uh, in Visualizer with the SP3 release to have in-product guided tools, which we call Hikes. Hikes provide a streamlined onboarding experience that helps improve the awareness and usability of the product. The in-product learning system guides the users through various scenarios and improves the generalized enablement. With this release, we have added up to four hikes, and we intend to add more hikes covering further features in our upcoming releases. Now, let us look at how hikes work and how you can use these hikes. So here is, uh, here is what you see when you download Visualizer and load it for the first time with Service Pack 3. It provides a list of the hikes that are available for the user to, uh, to use. Uh, some of the examples of these hikes are getting started, identity, uh, in, uh, creating an identity-based application, creating an object-based application, and uh, use, uh, using marketplace components. So in this particular case, we will start with you know, a, a hike, which takes us through creating an identity-based application. So if, if you look here, uh, this is kind of the example that we already went through. And now in this case, if we are using hikes, it provides you a couple of things that you see on the screen. One is it provides you a card, which we call as a hike card. And if you see on the bottom right uh, corner of the screen that says data panel, this card provides details on what the user is expected to do and how, uh, and it provides, you know, it, it provides a tour, it provides details on this, each of the steps that the, the, that the users can, you know, uh, can follow and go through the tutorial or the tool within this particular feature. The other thing you may have already noticed is an arrow that's pointing to the specific feature that this particular hike wants the users to, uh, uh, to go to, right? So in this particular case, you see the arrow now pointing to the sample services under the data panel. It points to the login service over here and expects the user uh, to you know, drag and drop the login service onto the button, and that is highlighted within the hike card. You may notice that the hike card moves uh, across the screen based on where the action that the user is expected to perform uh, is, is, is located within, within your visualizer screen, right, within your visualizer canvas. So the, each, of these, uh, each of these hike cards provides specific details on where the user uh, uh, should take specific actions. And when, when, you know, when, when a pop-up, like an uploading action editor comes in, it gives you specific details on what the user is expected to do within that as well, right? So moving ahead, I'll, I'll forward this a bit since we have already gone through this flow. What the, uh, what the hikes also allow the users to do is once, once you've created your, uh, you know, once you've designed your application within Visualizer, it also allows you to, it also helps you to run this application within your App Viewer app as well. Right? So if you have not downloaded the App Viewer app, the App Viewer app is available on the App Stores for both iOS and Android. Right? So it gives you those details, and it, it, it also tells you how you can connect your App Viewer to your existing visualizer. So once you connect App Viewer, at the top, it shows that your device is connected. And once your device is connected, we have the App Viewer running now, and it gives details of how you can run your application uh, to your connected App Viewer. So once once the user has connected the app viewer, the user can run the app viewer and uh, launch the app on within his within his device and follow through uh, or basically preview his entire application on a physical device itself. So this uh, on the left side now, if you if you see the arrow pointing to an icon on the left bar. This particular icon provides details uh, or provides an access to all the hikes that are available in Visualizer. So if, if in case you do not uh, see the, the first time launch of the hike, you can always go to this left icon and uh, the last icon on the blue navigation bar, and that will take you to the list of hikes that are available within Visualizer. So what we have seen today is we've seen we've uh, so here's a quick recap right on on the hikes uh, we have uh, seen the guided tools within Visualizer and how they help develop applications. 
uh, we have a set of guided cues that we talked about, as a set of hikes that we talked about that are available within Visualizer, uh, like uh, helping develop identity services, helping develop applications using object services, uh, and there are uh, other hikes like being able to use your app viewer, being able to use the marketplace components as well. With that, let me move on to the next uh, the next feature, which is progressive web apps. Progressive web applications are described as a collection of guidelines, technologies, design concepts, and web APIs that work in tandem to provide an app-like experience on the web. Progressive web apps use modern web APIs along with traditional progressive enhancement strategies to create cross-platform web applications. These apps work everywhere and provide several features that give them the same user experience and advantages as native apps. They can work offline, they can be installed on home screens, they can send push notifications, and basically they perform like applications. With regard to PWA, uh, the industry analysts go to go to the extent of saying this, and I quote: "If you are building for the web today, and if not, if you are not building it as a progressive web app, you are doing it wrong." So this is a quote directly from one of uh, one of the uh, industry analysts that we uh, that we work with. So with that, let's move ahead and see how this emerging experience has evolved and how it compares to uh, to, to native. On the native uh, side, you have technologies like Android, iOS, Windows, and uh, with these technologies, pretty much uh, how you design applications is uh, more in an adaptive fashion. So you design applications for mobile, you design applications for tablet, you design applications for a desktop or a watch, right? So it's more, it follows more of an adaptive design uh, concept. Uh, the modern uh, the modern experiences that are considered uh, native and some of these emerging experiences or emerging technologies are things like Core ML, ARKit, uh, SiriKit, and things like that. When this is compared with web, the technologies that you typically use for web are things like HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Each of these technologies uh, have have evolved, and over time, the design or design of these technologies has evolved to provide a responsive web. Uh, capabilities across the different form factors. So you have one one design that's responsive and that works across your mobiles, tablets, desktops. Uh, Kony, the Coney the app platform already provides a responsive uh, design capabilities. It provides a, a canvas where responsive applications can be designed and developed within Coney Visualizer. Moving ahead on to the modern experiences within web, what you see is progressive web apps is at the forefront of these modern, modern experiences and emerging technologies. Along with the progressive web apps, you see, see things like web components, which are, uh, which are again a major factor in some of these modern experiences. With that, we have, uh, the progressive web app has been a major enhancement that we have made as part of the Service Pack 3 release of this application. We have ensured that the, the enhancements that we make to the progressive web applications are following all the guidelines that are provided by Google in terms of progressive web apps. We have evaluated our applications that we have internally built for progressive web apps, and we are on. We have been able to achieve a score of 100 on Google Lighthouse, which is a tool to evaluate progressive web applications. A score of 100 on Google Lighthouse uh, tells you that we've been able to enable all the features or all the capabilities uh, that are expected as a part of a progressive web application. Now, this includes things like supporting service workers. So our SP3 release supports service workers as well, which uh, a service worker is basically a worker script that works behind the scenes providing features like caching, offline, and push messages. It can be considered as a proxy between server and the web application. Another feature that's considered extremely important to a progressive web application is the concept of an app manifest. A web application, uh, a web app manifest uh, provides the capabilities of installability and basically allows the user to pin the web application as an icon on the device home screen like an app and provide offline functions. There are other features within the progressive web application guidelines that we already provide support or we have enhanced within this release. We've already provide, we already provide support for responsive web and we have made several enhancements to this particular aspect. 
uh, and we've also made enhancements to the entire load time because one of the major guidelines of, uh, of pro progressive web application is faster load and faster form navigation. So for this aspect, we've in provided enhancements, performance enhancements in terms of web application load time, providing async capabilities, providing enhancements to the CSS load times and things like that. Some of the other features and some of the other notable features as part of progress of web applications is to be able to have the applications be discoverable using search engines and provide native capabilities provided by the browsers. It also provides uh, a, a, a progressive web application is also expected to provide capabilities for web push messages. And what we have provided uh, as part of the SP3 release is being uh, having the capability to integrate with third-party web push libraries as well. We have made several other enhancements to web apart from progressive web application uh, cap enhancements, and these are really these are applicable across responsive web. Uh, things like automated web build and web test using the App Factory. We've also added enhancements like offline objects capability for our responsive web and SPA. We have also in enhanced the security for web by adding features like an HTTPS integrity check uh, for web. So these are the some of the capabilities that we have provided for web. And let's go into some of the specifics over here. Uh, if I uh, this is just presenting an uh, example of how an offline access using the service workers work with a progressive web app. So in a traditional web app, if you are in uh, suppose out of network or if you are uh, in an aeroplane mode, what you would see is basically a, uh, a an error screen that kind of says that there is no internet and the application cannot load. But if it was a uh, progressive web application, since the application gets cached locally as part of the uh, as part of the service worker capabilities, when you load an application or when you click on an application icon, what happens is it loads the application from the cache, and you can still work with your application while you're offline. Here is the example of what happens when you have a web man web manifest added as part of the progressive web application. It, what it provides is the capability to pin a web application to the home screen. So, the, so when a progressive web application loads, you, it provides an option to the user to add a, this particular application to the home screen. And once you select that option, it directly pins your application onto the home screen of your device. Uh, there are several of the features that can be achieved using a web manifest, like being able to theme your application. In this particular case, you, you see the address bar is branded as red at the top. Uh, to go with the design of this application itself. So these are some of the applications that, that are provided within uh, Visualizer. Now here is an here is a example or a demo of how you can you know in, uh, enable progressive web applications within a Pony app, uh, within a Pony uh, Visualizer project. You go in, you select, uh, you go into the project settings. There is a checkbox to enable progressive web app, and then there is an option to select the web manifest file. The web manifest file is already available within project, so you can go ahead and you can edit an existing web manifest file. I do that, I have an existing project, I just enable progressive web app on that, and then I go ahead and build the project. It's as easy as that. So now what you see here is the Kony app platform now provides this low code capability to design and develop progressive web apps from existing apps that you already have. Now I have this application loaded and went ahead and you know I can add this to the home screen, add my icon to the home screen, and I did that. And what you see is I have this uh, icon on the home screen and I can launch my application from the home screen itself. Now what I'll go ahead and do is I'll go ahead and go to an offline mode. I'll turn the Wi-Fi off and run this application while I'm offline. So this is an, this is th this is a simple application over here, but you can design much more. Uh, you know, uh, complex and uh, much uh, much more enhanced uh, uh, applications with enhanced UX and things like that uh, using the responsive web capabilities that we have today. So what I'm doing here basically is I'm going ahead and adding certain uh, you know events and things like that within my application, adding expenses, right? And this is all happening while I am offline. Right, so I go ahead, I'll uh, add all these uh, expenses, I add all these details, and what I can do is I can then go go online, and as soon as I go online, all of these data is synced uh, to uh, to my server using the offline objects. Right, so I can work offline and you know sync all these data, all those data, and uh, you know uh, all of it gets synced as soon as I am online. Now this is an example of uh, evaluating this on the Google Lighthouse. In this particular case, we have evaluated this. I think in this application, we've 
we've been at a 90, 91%. But uh, we can move this, uh, and we, we have all the enhancements available today to move to 100% on the Google Lighthouse as well. So I'll just move ahead and give you a quick summary of all the all the all the features that we talked about on the Progressive Web App. Uh, so the, this is all the features that are available. Uh, the support for Progressive Web App is part of SP3, and we have several features supporting that. So here, with that, here is a recap of uh, the three features of SP3 that we just reviewed. Uh, the simplified data integration, the guided tools, uh, which we call hikes, and the progressive web application. But that is not all, because the SP3 release also has much more front-end application development capabilities, and here they are. All this and more is available for you to explore on the What's New page on Pony Basecamp. With that, I pass this on to Suhas, who will now share the details on the backend capabilities. Thanks, Sezan. Guys, just give me one minute. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, so now I'll go ahead with the fabric overview of the Service Pack 3. So we have, um, let's start looking at the productivity features that we have built as part of SP3. <coughs> so we look at the service called as <coughs> Stub Data. So Stub um, is basically a service that lets us develop the client application project even when the enterprise backend is being updated simultaneously or it is not ready yet, right? So in many scenarios, we have seen that the interface is available for the client development to happen, but the actual uh, backend is not available for the client app to hit and get the data. So in these kind of scenarios, stub data gives us an option of um, testing your entire client application and server application without the backend actually being there. So for example, the way the request works is it, as usual, goes from the client device to the server, and in the server, it will hit your preprocessor logic, and we'll have a check to see if the stubbing is true or not. And if it is true, it just goes to the database or um, data that is stored on the server and runs it. And if not, uh, it goes to the actual backend and gets the data from the same. And then it will apply your transformation as well as any post processor. Uh, any code that you have written will still get executed, and then the response gets sent back to the device. So you have the option of sending any hard coded data or uh, generating data from a template. And you also have the option of passing parameters and, say, from the request and getting passed as part of the response so that you can simulate the behavior of an actual session happening uh, using the stub template. So stub also allows you to 
randomize the data that is coming so that you know uh, like if you're hitting an actual service uh, if you're hitting with user you're going to get some data if you're getting with user b you're going to get some other data so that randomization is also available and you can also make use of several inbuilt functions that we have built like you know to simulate a first name or a last name or a float or a, a random from a set that you have defined uh, or an email or phone number and various kind of stuff and you can even vary the number of records that is being returned from a stub so stub also has some advanced capabilities such as you can um, you also have the option of identifying at runtime whether the data is coming from a stub or a live because for the regular user end user is not going to be able to see a difference but we have specified some headers and stuff which we look into as part of the demo uh, to see how we can do that and you also have the option at runtime for example to switch between the live or a stub this is very helpful during development because you might be developing with the backend and the backend is suddenly not available or is having some issues you can without modifying the client application code just jump uh, make a switch in your uh, what to say via a parameter that you have exposed to switch all the services to use the stub instead of the live and continue your testing and development and it also provides you an easy way of to find out you know whether the issue is from the actual backend data or your code and lets you do all these uh, Uh, mix and match while you are building it for troubleshooting. So here we look at a demo of the stub service. So we have an app which is uh, going to use integration, and a stub is basically supported for XML and JSON, which is our top two services. So you go to the advanced section, and you have a stub backend response. In this particular example, we are taking parameters from the input by using the request body and request header options. and we are taking the department id for example from the header and the name from the request body and we are passing it and you can see that the backend response and the passed data is actually using the data that we passed as part of the input the next we are going to see how to use a template in this i have a template which is saying repeat 5 to 10 which means i can run it for up to you know an array will returning any element between 5 to 10 and you saw that there were several functions here let me just pause for a minute so we have a salary which is going to get a concatenated value from a float between a range we have age which is an integer we have name which is using the first name and surname we are using gender which is using another function and random we have passed a set of values for random like in this case a designation like vp or director or hr or whatever and it will pick something random from this we have can use make use of the random function you have the concat function there is a whole set of functions you can use the documentation to get a whole list of it but this gives you the option of you know understanding the power of using the stub template and you can actually mix and match the data as well it's not like you have to use all the data from the template or uh, use it only from the hard code you can combine uh, data that is hard coded or getting it from the request or input parameter or just coded into the template so you can use a mix and match of all of them so once you develop this you have to publish it for the operation to be testable from an end user device so we publish it as a regular app and then you can go and test it from the uh, app or in this case we are showing it from the admin console of the runtime so i'll skip through this because we are showing the same thing the other option that i said that you can actually um differentiate that the request is coming from stub or from backend is by using this response header called as coni stub response this will be true if you are using stub so this way you can add code in your client app to know whether it is coming from stub or not and even if a response uh, even if a service is not enabled as or published as stub so it is basically have defined the template but you have not selected the stub checkbox while publishing so that means it inherently has the capability but it is going via the back end route for now so we have an option for the app developer to actually send an input parameter and get the stub response even for such cases so in this case here we are seeing that the service was published with stub false and when you just send it then there is no back end it is going to just say invalid json response or some such error message so we can go 
and go to the stub uh, request and add a parameter saying xconi stub request equals true and what this allows is it allows it to flip and get the data from the actual uh, stub data now so now you will get the response so this is how you can simulate at runtime by sending an extra header to get the stub or not now there will also be a concern like hey i all this is fine i can use this for my development but in actual production i don't want to use any of this i want to completely turn off stubbing so there is an option for that as well and uh, um, that is on that and more detail is covered as part of the blogs and documentation so let's move on to the next uh, section here so i'm not sure how familiar you guys are with the um, the generation of the uh, response parameters from um, uh, the back end response actually so earlier we used to have to actually put the x path code for each and everything or the json path for getting the actual uh, mapping of the back end data to result parameters that you are going to pass to the client app we have had this option of just generate response or create response uh, for both json and xml i just wanted to highlight this because i don't think many people are still aware of this so once you generate and from the test panel in uh, the coni fabric you will have an option like this to say create response once you click click it it will generate it for all the fields that are there in the response then you can just go ahead and remove whatever you do not want it will take care of creating the collections items within collection and the whole thing so it will also show you what json path or xpath it is using for getting that particular value so that if you want to you know uh, write some of the xpath yourself you can do that and we also want to call that um, we have had we have added support for json library parsing so if you are using json services you can just use with json library uh, earlier we used to have only for the xpath library so to speak and if you use the json library it will be at least 50% faster than the previous one so uh, another service that we have, another uh, feature that we have added is uh, for specifically for customers who are in cloud and who have to access their backends via the vpn so usually uh, the vpn is connected to the runtime server and the service definition is usually done from the fabric server and the fabric server cannot connect to the backend and so you have to painfully create the metadata and uh, the structure for example if you are connecting to a database you have to create the structure yourself by having to look at something else as the, the data structure diagram or something but now with sp3 we have allowed directly to choose while creating the service itself to choose a runtime server and if that runtime server has the vpn connection you can directly use that and this allows us for example for database and especially like that to see the entire database structure and you can just drag and drop what you want into the object model and it makes your service creation far easier other productivity enhancements that we have done is uh, we have also added support for external caching from the coni fabric server um, it uh, can interface with anything which supports jcache but primarily we have tested it with redis uh, in addition to the ehash cache that we already had right and the memcache and uh, as part of the engagement service um, we have an option of scheduling messages to be sent at a future time um, so uh, sometimes you have to should cancel the schedule it's just like canceling a scheduled payment right so we have added an option in the ui as well as the api to go ahead and canceled messages that have already been scheduled for future delivery also we have added the ability to uh, purge and archive uh, the data that is there in the engagement service just for a optimization uh, server optimization perspective now let's move on to object services so coni has had object services for quite a while uh, but uh, we always had few people ask that hey i want to have the option of writing a pre or post processor for those of you that are not aware pre processor is basically some java logic or javascript logic that you write which runs before execution before calling the actual backend service and post processor is after the data is returned from the external call you write some other, some more logic to parse it or whatever business logic you want before it is sent back to the device so with service pack 3 we have added this option of writing pre and post processor for object services as well you can do several things like you know uh, adding custom header or changing request response values access for you have access to the full http body so 
this is a new feature that we have added as part of Service Pack 3. Now let's move on to API management. So API management is basically an option for accessing the APIs alone directly without an app. Uh, so this is more for uh, API vendors and uh, uh, such. So we have had traditionally the API not being completely restified uh, because it is actually mapping to, for example, um, let me just show it from an example. So we have a pet store which has a, a URL and the different operations like add, delete, get and update are mapped to different uh, operations like add pet or delete pet or get pet by ID. So this is the actual operation which it maps to. But from a front end perspective or from the API that you're exposing to the end user, you might want it to be just like a simple CRUD, like get, put, post, delete. So we have the option now in uh, Service Pack 3 where you can go and change the verb, like the HTTP verb, like post or get, as well as the actual URL. For example, if you're trying to get information about a specific pet, you might just want to get, uh, pass the ID and get the value of it or modify it or delete it, all right? So you can now create fully restified interface using this. API management front-end URL. So let me quickly show you how you can set this. So here we have the URL, um, and we have this UR section called as front-end API, which you can select to um, enable a different custom front-end URL, and you can modify the value there to, um, for this case, just passing a parameter like ID, which is there from the request. So we see the request having an ID, we put that ID, and then we save and uh, we also change the verb from post to get for the get URL. And then we can um, save it and publish it. And then you will be able to get the uh, front end your API updated accordingly. So once you have made these changes and published the app, you can actually go to the developer portal and uh, click on that app and uh, see the modifications that we have done, reflect and uh, for the specific API that we are looking at, you can see that uh, the post get put that we changed has reflected in the developer portal. So now let's move on to um, another feature that we have built. So, uh, as part of Service Pack 3, we have added the option for API management vendors to find usage, uh, usage, get usage reports on specific APIs. So you can get the data on a, a specific Fabric backend app or on a particular service or even an operation. And from the reporting perspective, we have now the option of differentiating whether the request is coming from you know, a direct uh, API client that is uh, coming from a uh, Kony Fabric SDK in a Kony Visualizer built app or a native built app using Fabric SDK, or whether it is coming from a direct HTTP call to the API management. So you can even track the API usage based on the client type as well. And we also have uh, enhanced the OAuth capabilities or identity capabilities for API management. Kony has already supported several different types of identity services. But what we have added now is ability to do a custom identity. Custom identity is basically you write your logic via a Java service or an integration service and use that as uh, your custom uh, identity. And we have the option of using an OAuth server, which you can customize. So you don't necessarily have to have an OAuth, but you can use the custom identity as a OAuth server, and you can modify what shows up in the, the you know the user input dialog for the OAuth and uh, gives you uh, more enhanced uh, security or more flexibility in terms of uh, exposing your APIs to the back. Uh, moving on, let's look at offline objects. For those of you that are not familiar, offline objects is a new offline sync capability, uh, offline app capability that we provided as part of V8. And we have been building it, building more and more features on top of it. So specific points to remember here is this is built on top of the Fabric V8 itself. It is not a separate server like the earlier sync model. And it is highly performant. It has been completely redesigned and it is at least five to 10x faster than the sync server. 
and it also has several more advanced capabilities like in app feedback parallel sync um rollback custom conflict resolution and so on and we have had support for ios and android until service pack 2 what we have done now as part of uh, service pack 3 is primarily we have added support for spa on desktop web which in, even includes pwa any kind of uh, web application that you are building from coni visualizer and we also have added support for windows 10 so windows 10 support is currently in beta uh, but anybody any customer who is willing to give it a try just reach out to me and uh, we can get you set up and you can start playing with it and another feature that we have added as part of service pack 3 is the ability to do a custom conflict resolution via java class so basically conflict resolution is basically when your client app has modified the data and server has modified the exact same data and when you are trying to synchronize there is a conflict so this is something like a merge conflict right so usually have policies like server wins client wins where you are letting one override the other but you might want more control like look at stuff in a field by field level and write some business logic in the java class which actually decides what happens so that level of granularity and functionality is now available as part of the um, sp3 release and we also added support for storage objects and more granular dropping of offline data in a service as well as uh, um, support for writing read only sql queries directly for querying the on premise i'm sorry on the on device database um i am not going to have time to go through in the detail uh, i'll point you to the log documentation and links that we have on this uh, but primary things to remain uh, remember is that the support for spa desktop web and windows was released only now and uh, ios and android has been there for a much longer time so the feature set for this is going to be lesser but we are building and we will try to get to the same level of feature capability across the releases uh, across the platforms in a couple of releases to start with these are the features that are available as part of the service pack 3 and one point to remember here is uh, the prerequisite is it has to be ecmascript 6 compliant the app and then when it comes to offline objects then there are a couple of more uh, uh, prerequisites uh, because we have to make the app work on store as well as kiosk kind of models so we had to put some restrictions and because the os is completely different uh, we had to choose a set of prerequisites that allows us to develop from one code base which serves both the purposes and uh, these are the features that are supported as part of uh, offline objects and this is the conflict resolution where you can actually upload your java class and get the data um analytics breadcrumbs so coni has been capturing several application events uh like form entry exit service calls clicking a button or you know uh any errors that were caught any exceptions that app developer caught or even a crash so traditionally for troubleshooting for especially difficult to recreate kind of issues you need to know what the user was actually doing that led to the crash so as part of crash breadcrumbs what we have done is we have the option of checking what were the last 10 events that the user did just before the app crashed so this is added as part of uh, app crash breadcrumbs uh, you will have a report which you can see which will get you the crash details and uh, we have also added environment monitoring uh, which will let you see the server stat in terms of the cpu memory and thread um, and you have graphs which you can see on data per node basis um in the interest of time again i'm going to run through this and we also have enhanced the service monitoring capability that we introduced in service pack 2 with more graphs and uh, option to search for a specific service and have a dashboard which shows you the count of calls and average and error count and so on for the app factory which is basically coni's uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment model which lets you you know check in a project um and uh, build it for any of the exposed platforms as well as uh, run specific tests once the build is done and send the test results automatically to a set of uh, uh, pre configured users in, via email so this is basically what is coni devops uh, app factory and uh, we have 
added more features to this as part of SP3. We have added the option of uh, uh, building it for HTML5 responsive web and SPA. We have added the option of using third-party integration just like we have for Fabric, so you can use something like an Octa or uh, any third-party integration to do it. We also have the option of manually putting in the certs, especially for iOS and profiles and such, so that it will automatically sign with those certs. You have option for uh, supporting protected mode release, as well as uh, we have improved the testing emails and uh, web testing via APM and uh, Selenium has been, APM and Selenium has been uh, improved as well. From a perf improvement, uh, we have from for engagement purposes, services, we have increased the rate of push messages significantly. It has gone up to almost 16x. Uh, we have added uh, push messages scheduling with segments, and even the subscriber search feature has been improved significantly. And the analytics and reporting capability also has been significantly improved for cloud and on-prem. Uh, reporting is almost 50x faster if you had very huge amount of data. And even the metrics processing onto cloud has been improved significantly. Even for on-premising, on-premises metrics uh, processing, we've increased the um, uh, performance via uh, uh, some, uh, what to say, topology changes as well as design changes, and we are almost five to nine x faster in that aspect now. So just revisiting the themes that we had for the service pack three, and uh, as uh, discussed, we have a lot more features which we can't cover in this particular call. Uh, there is a Basecamp What's New page, which looks like uh, here. It will have all the major features highlighted with any related documentation, or we have created a lot of self-help enablement uh, in the form of articles or video tutorials and such. And all those will also be available directly under the specific topic itself in the What's New page of Basecamp. I request all of you to please go to that page as soon as this call is over. And for the full-fledged release notes of all the features that are there, uh, we have another page which you can link and uh, uh, view the full release notes. Uh, with that, uh, I'll pass over the control to Tanmay. All right. Uh, thanks, Faison. Thanks, Suhas, for taking this session. This was indeed a good, good session. Great session with a lot of info. Um, and I'm sure the session was useful to everybody who has joined us today. Now, uh, before I um, take you to the group that I was talking about initially, let me just uh, take you all to some of the slides very quickly, um, so that uh, you know we are on we are all on same page. Now, uh, we have started a new program called Ask Us Anything, um, which is every Wednesday 10 a.m. Central. You guys can join in. Uh, it's a chat window that we open uh, every Wednesday, and uh, all you need to do is to just log in, and there is no uh, voice um, enabled uh, during this session. You can just chat with the experts that we have online um, every Wednesday. So um, for all details, you can go to basecamp.coni.com slash s slash events, and uh, you're going to see um, you know, all the details about this event. Uh, we have next webinar on uh, 14th of November which is on how to debug in Konya platform. It will be a great session. So again, the uh, details are available under the events page, so you can go and register. Um, and then uh, th these are a couple of uh, links that you guys can follow. Uh, follow us on social media. Uh, we are on Facebook, YouTube. There is a separate channel for Basecamp on YouTube. You can follow all the videos over there. And you can follow us on Twitter. We do a lot of tweets about uh, what is happening um, um, in Kony. So follow the hashtag, and uh, you will get the get all the news there. Uh, and then um, this webinar recording, you see the second point in this slide. So as I said, um, you know, uh, if you want to read about events, you can go to this page. Webinar recording is also available on this page. So when you go to this page on the right hand side, you will see all the recorded webinars, um, you know, the past webinars recording links available. So go to this page and um, tomorrow you will see this webinar recording as well over there. So uh, make sure you go to this page and, um, you know, look at the recording, recorded webinars. Can now, I, um, you're not sharing your screen. Stu Haas is still sharing his screen. So um, there you go. Okay. Okay. So you need to go to the, yeah, there you go. I've also put it in the chat, everyone. All right. Can you now see my screen? Yes. 
Okay. So let me go back once again. Um, but anyways, I've couple of, um, you know, explained everything. So let me take you to this one. So this slide is for um, all of the attendees now. So now go to this group. Um, you can go to basecamp.coni.com and click on community, click on groups, and then you will see a private group called Feedback Wave 1 group. I request you all to please join this group. You can even go to bit.ly slash Coney Early Adopter. Uh, that's the bit.ly link. Click on this link, um, go to this group and um, request for the access. Since it's a private group, you will see ask to join button on the right hand side top. Uh, we are going to give you the access. Participate in this program. All you need to do is when you are um, uh, in the inside this group, you will see three steps that you need to follow. Follow all these three steps. There is a scenario that you need to follow and you have to complete a survey. After that, when you submit the survey, we'll get the notification and you stand a chance to win uh, $25 gift card. There is also a raffle um, award available, which is $100 um, prize, gift card prize, and then you, you, you're also eligible for that. Uh, so one of you will, will win that $100 card. So make sure you participate um, and follow all the steps available over there. Um, and uh, for all the questions that I see right now is all answered um, while I was talking and then um, you know during the event, during the webinar, we have answered all the questions. If you still have questions, you have Basecamp forum, go to Basecamp, ask any questions. Um, and uh, you know if there is anything later that comes up, uh, feel free to post in forums. Thank you everybody for your time today. Um, we look forward, uh, you know, everybody, everybody join this um, program that you see over the screen, over screen right now. Join this program. Uh, it will be really good to see you all there. Um, post your questions on Basecamp and thank you once again for joining the session today. Thank you.